Hi, this is Dr. Joshua Cooper, and in this five module presentation, I'm planning to discuss the basics of entrainment pacing during reentrant arrhythmias and the significance of the post pacing interval. I will discuss the specific circumstances that allow myocardial reentry to occur, and then review what happens when one performs pacing maneuvers and records electrograms during tachycardia. By starting and stopping pacing at different sites and analyzing what happens right after pacing is stopped, the size and location of a reentry circuit can be determined. So let's start with the first module to review the concept of reentry. I would be remiss if I did not first take a moment to acknowledge the brilliance and the contributions of George Ralph Mines. As a young physiologist at age 27, over 100 years ago, even despite the limited technology available at the time, he was able to describe the properties of cardiac tissue that allowed for myocardial reentry to occur. He created a number of inventions of his own to describe and characterize wavefront propagation, conduction velocity, and tissue refractoriness and he demonstrated how those combined in a particular way in order to allow for sustained reentry. It is truly remarkable to read his manuscript published in 1913 with regard to its accuracy and the durability of the concepts that he discovered. Even this diagram that he hand drew remains so accurate that we have used almost an identical representation of this when we talk about the concept of reentry over the next 100 years, despite all of the technological advances that have occurred in the interim. In fact, throughout my presentation, you'll see that I will use a very similar type of figure when I'm talking about the concepts of conduction velocity and refractoriness and how reentry can occur. So hats off to George Ralph Mines. The first critical ingredient for reentry to occur is an electrical barrier. And what I mean by that is in order to get from point A in the myocardium over to point B, there have to be two separate routes that you can follow. And there's no communication between the two, meaning there is an electrical barrier to the transmission of signals between one path and the other. And when signals travel from A to B, they travel around that electrical barrier. If that barrier did not exist, and this were a continuous sheet of myocardium, then signals could simply travel across from A to B, and there would be no ability to have a reentry circuit. We always seem to draw these circuits as a circle, even though in reality it's much more complex than that. And in part, it's just due to the simplicity of drawing a circle, as well as probably paying respects to George Ralph Mines, who created those initial drawings in 1913. We could certainly draw a rectangle, although that's not very physiologic and not seen in nature. And we certainly could also draw a much more complex shape that approximates reality, although in reality these circuits are often three-dimensional and not two-dimensional. It's just easier when we're describing these principles to draw a circle, but recognizing that a true circuit is much more complex than that. It's important to think of the circuit not just as a geometric shape, but think of it in terms of the myocytes that create it. In order for a signal to pass across myocardial tissue, you need cell-to-cell -cell conduction that we're going to briefly review in more detail. When a signal travels around the circuit, it passes from one cell into the next, and that's where we have to go back and think about the action potential of each cell in order to understand the second basic ingredient that's necessary for reentry to occur in myocardium. Here is a myocyte, and here is its action potential. And as you recall, each myocyte in turn has a depolarization phase and a repolarization phase. During the repolarization phase, there is a period of time that the cell absolutely cannot be re-stimulated. That's called its absolute refractory period. There is a short period of time where the cell with a high stimulus strength is able to be activated. That's called the relative refractory period. 
And then when the cell has fully repolarized, the cell is now excitable once again. In order for a reentry circuit to occur, passing cell to cell around an electrical barrier, every cell must have repolarized by the time the signal reaches it for a second time. In other words, at every site around the circuit, the refractory period must be shorter than the conduction time around that circuit. If that's not the case and the refractory period is longer or the conduction time is faster, then you're going to have a wavefront meet refractory myocytes, not be able to stimulate them, and the circuit will extinguish and terminate. The way we often represent this concept of depolarization and repolarization in a circuit is by drawing an arrow around the circuit. And the head of this arrow is meant to represent the leading wavefront where depolarization is occurring in myocytes that have recovered. And if you travel backward around the arrow, these represent different parts of the circuit that all are refractory. And when you get back to the very tail end of the arrow, that represents where myocytes have finally recovered and are excitable once again. Notice that there is a space between the head and the tail of the arrow, and that zone represents myocytes that have completed their action potential, have fully repolarized, and are excitable once again. And the presence of that space between the head and the tail is exactly the principle that allows for reentry to occur. While the head of the arrow is advancing, the tail is receding, and in between the two, you have a zone of myocytes that has fully recovered. And that zone has a name. It's known as the excitable gap that's drawn here in green. It's important to recognize that the excitable gap is actually also revolving around the circuit, like this. The head is traveling into myocytes that now become refractory, and the tail is receding where myocytes have recovered and are excitable once again. And this concept of an excitable gap that's rotating around the circuit is going to become very important when we talk about entrainment. So let's move on to the concept of pacing in the same chamber as a reentry circuit and see how that pacing stimulus and wavefront that propagates from it interacts with the circuit itself. Here is a reentry circuit with its excitable gap drawn in green again. And here is a pacing stimulus that is delivered in the same chamber as the circuit, sending a wavefront toward the circuit and hitting refractory tissue as demonstrated by the body of the arrow in the circuit itself. So this pacing stimulus does not impact the circuit because the wavefront is reaching a part of the circuit that is not excitable. Although it depends on the size and properties of the circuit and the proximity between the pacing site and the nearest part of the circuit, it's a bit of a game of chance whether one beat can actually penetrate and stimulate excitable tissue within that circuit. So often multiple beats in a row must be delivered in order to try to pace and enter excitable tissue within that circuit. So let's see what happens in this case if the circuit itself has a cycle length of 300 milliseconds, meaning that's how long it took for a wavefront to travel completely around one revolution of the circuit. And we then pace a number of beats in a row also at 300 milliseconds, the same rate as the tachycardia. Again, that first beat met refractory tissue. If we pace at the same rate, then the second beat and the third beat and the fourth beat will all hit exactly that same refractory part of the tissue, kind of like a strobe light effect when watching a spinning wheel that looks stationary if the rate of the strobe light is flashing at exactly the same rate that the wheel is revolving. 
you will never enter the excitable gap if you pace at the same rate as the tachycardia if the first beat hit refractory tissue. And so, in order to penetrate excitable gap tissue, you need to pick a different pacing cycle length from that of the tachycardia. And this slide will demonstrate what happens if you select a longer cycle length or a slower pacing rate than the tachycardia. Here's that first beat meeting refractory tissue. And here's the circuit traveling around at 300 milliseconds. And here is the pacing stimulus at 330 milliseconds, longer than the tachycardia cycle length. And what happened is because you waited so long, the wavefront from the circuit traveled partway toward your pacing site, and you now had a collision of wavefronts between your pacing site and the circuit approaching your oncoming wavefront, and you didn't even reach the circuit in the first place. So pacing slower than the tachycardia will almost always allow the circuit to dominate, and you will not be able to compete with it with your pacing, and you will be unsuccessful if you're attempting to stimulate tissue within the circuit. In contrast, let's see what happens if you pace a little bit faster than the tachycardia. Here is that first paced beat meeting refractory tissue. And here is the circuit traveling around at 300 milliseconds. And here's what happens when you pace a little faster at 280 milliseconds, a slightly shorter cycle length. Notice that the excitable gap is actually a little bit back from where it had started. Let's compare with the initial starting point up top so by pacing faster, you came in at a time before the wavefront had a chance to get as far as its starting point. If you pace again and again a little bit faster, then that excitable gap will migrate backward toward your pacing site, or at least where the pacing site wavefront is reaching the circuit at its closest point. Here is another beat where we're close, but still meeting refractory tissue near the head of the wavefront. And if you have enough beats in a row, eventually the excitable gap will migrate back and allow penetration of your pacing wavefront into excitable gap tissue, stimulating that tissue. It's an interesting point to consider where in the excitable gap did my pacing stimulus activate recovered myocytes? Because you can potentially activate tissue either near the tail of the arrow, the receding edge of the wavefront, or near the head, near the oncoming wavefront of the next beat. Here's what happens if you capture tissue at the front edge of the excitable gap near the tail. There's your stimulus. There's the wavefront that reaches green tissue, the excitable gap, and that will excite tissue in retrograde fashion toward the oncoming wavefront, and you will have a collision of wavefronts and extinguishing of propagation at that end of the excitable gap. And if you're close enough to the tail, you will also meet refractory period as that wavefront moves forward in the anterograde direction in the excitable gap. And if you have block in both the backwards and forwards part of your stimulation of that excitable gap, then you will have terminated reentry and the circuit will stop. This is an important principle that explains how pace termination of an arrhythmia occurs, whether it is done manually or whether it is done automatically by an anti-tachy pacing algorithm in a defibrillator or occasionally in certain types of pacemakers. Now here's where it gets interesting. Let's explore what happens when you stimulate the excitable gap just beyond the oncoming wavefront near the leading edge rather than near the trailing edge of the excitable gap. Here's a pacing stimulus that sends a wavefront that enters the excitable gap near the head of the arrow, the oncoming wavefront of the reentry circuit. Just like the previous scenario, 
where this stimulates the excitable gap will allow propagation of that wavefront in both directions within the excitable gap. The retrograde component of this will end up colliding with the oncoming wavefront and extinguish. However, in the forward direction, as long as there's enough distance between the stimulation site and the tail of the arrow, that wavefront will be able to propagate forward and actually not catch the tail of the arrow. In fact, a better way to draw this is to show that the excitable gap continues to move forward as the tail of the arrow continues to repolarize and recover, while the oncoming new wavefront generated by the pacing stimulus will create refractory tissue in the forward direction. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to start by talking about stimulating the excitable gap with pacing actually directly within the circuit and within the excitable gap, let's say at this location. As we pace and capture that excitable tissue, which remember from before might have taken a number of beats in a row because pacing at that site might originally have fallen on refractory tissue, but let's say we get to the point where the excitable gap is matching our pacing location and we pace on an ongoing basis. If the circuit has a cycle length of 300 milliseconds, and remember that's how long it would take to travel on its own all the way around one revolution. And let's say we pace a little bit faster at 280 milliseconds. What ends up happening is that we've actually, in reality, leapfrogged the oncoming wavefront from this location where it was at that moment in time at 280 milliseconds and stimulated at a 20 millisecond site ahead of it. What you've effectively done is created a new wavefront that travels from this site, having skipped 20 milliseconds that normally would have needed to occur when the spontaneous rhythm would have had to travel that extra distance to the pacing site and then carry on through the rest of the excitable gap. You can actually do this same pacing maneuver on an ongoing basis, even after you've captured the excitable gap that first time. So here we are traveling around the circuit and skipping 20 milliseconds between the oncoming wavefront and the pacing site. And that stimulus sends a new wavefront traveling forward. And if we keep pacing at that 280 millisecond cycle length, we're going to now have accelerated the circuit to the 280 millisecond pacing rate. I put the 300 milliseconds now in brackets because we're not actually seeing a full 300 millisecond revolution of the circuit because once the pacing stimulus wavefront has traveled around here to this site, at 280 milliseconds, we pace yet again, and we don't allow for the full 300 milliseconds to elapse to allow the spontaneous circuit to continue to completion. This is known as entrainment. Entrainment means that you have paced at a faster rate than the reentry circuit was traveling on its own, and you were able to leapfrog and accelerate the circuit over and over again so that you're still sending wavefronts around the circuit, but now at a rate that is exactly the same as your pacing rate rather than the native tachycardia. Some people use the term resetting to mean that you have captured the excitable gap and have advanced a new wavefront earlier around the circuit. And instead of using the term entrainment, they use the term continuous resetting to mean that you have done this over and over again, taking over the circuit. But regardless of whether you use the term entrainment or continuous resetting, we're talking about the concept of pacing faster than the tachycardia and sending wavefronts around the circuit at the pacing rate, thereby taking it over. You can actually 
accomplish the same feat of advancing the circuit with a single paced beat remotely, as we alluded to before, rather than pacing directly in the excitable gap like I was just showing. So here, we're pacing from a remote location at 280 milliseconds for one beat, and that wavefront propagates and enters the excitable gap at a location where it is able to propagate forward and not catch the tail of the receding wavefront. And again, what we've accomplished by doing so is leapfrogging the oncoming wavefront that naturally occurred around the circuit and jumped it forward to the site where the pacing stimulus had activated the excitable gap and sent a new wavefront forward, thereby again skipping, in this case, 20 milliseconds, that being the difference between the cycle length of the circuit and the faster pacing rate that we have selected from this remote site. We can deliver multiple paced beats in a row from that same remote site and, and train the circuit remotely exactly in the same fashion that we did when we were pacing within the circuit and within the excitable gap itself. So here's what that would look like. We would send a wavefront at that 280 millisecond mark to the circuit and capture it, thereby leapfrogging the circuit from the head at the 280 millisecond mark to this new location and sending a new wavefront forward at that location and at that time. So again, we have entrained the circuit by accelerating it to the pacing rate and not terminating it. And this can be accomplished whether you are within the circuit or outside of the circuit sending wavefronts at that faster pacing rate and capturing the circuit remotely. This is the module where we really talk about the post-pacing interval and these concepts of entrainment and electrogram recording all come together. We're going to talk about recording electrograms within a circuit, remote from a circuit, and what happens when we entrain and stop pacing during a tachycardia. So here again is our circuit, and here is a bipole, a pair of electrodes recording within the circuit. And I'm using here very similar images that I did in my intracardiac electrogram modules. Uh, the gray squares depict the electrodes themselves, and the green oval around them depicts the field of view of that bipolar recording made between the two. Here is the window where I'm going to show the electrograms as they are recorded while a tachycardia reentry circuit is occurring. Here is reentry occurring, and you can see from that bipole that we are recording inscribed electrograms at fixed intervals all along the window while tachycardia is ongoing. The spacing between those electrograms is 300 milliseconds, which is the tachycardia cycle length that I've selected for these modules. And the question then comes up, what happens if we move that bipole to a different location? We are always recording bipolar electrograms from multiple locations within the chamber of interest and in the opposite chamber as well. And that's often both with a multipolar catheter that has multiple bipoles on it, and often with more than one catheter, and frequently both catheters have multiple bipoles as well. So here, if we move that bipole to a different location also within the circuit, let's see what happens to the inscribed and recorded electrograms during tachycardia. Well, it looks very similar in that we have intracardiac electrograms that are inscribed at regular intervals every time the wavefront passes that bipole, and the spacing between them, again, is 300 milliseconds, the same as the tachycardia cycle length. But if you compare the two sites that I just showed, you'll see that there is a frame shift. 
the electrograms, of course, are not going to occur at the same time. The red dotted line shows, for example, the wavefront passing this bipole down here, which is actually happening between two inscribed electrograms from the other set of bipoles that I've depicted because the wavefront is remote from that second location. But recognize that both sites will, of course, record electrograms at the tachycardia cycle length. Well, what if we actually move our recording bipole outside of the circuit rather than within the circuit itself? We're always going to be recording signals from outside of the circuit, often using an ablation catheter, which is usually referred to as a mapping catheter when you're not yet delivering energy. And let's have a look at what happens to the electrograms at this remote site during tachycardia. Here is the circuit that is revolving around. And when the leading edge of the wavefront reaches the closest point to where the bipole is recording, then a wavefront will emanate from the circuit toward that bipole, and you will then inscribe an electrogram when that wavefront reaches the bipole. So every time the circuit travels around once to that closest location, it'll send off a wavefront toward your bipole and you'll create an electrogram. Again, because the wavefronts will be hitting that bipole at exactly the same rate as the tachycardia, even though you're remote from the circuit, you're going to have a 300 millisecond spacing between electrograms. Now here is where it gets very interesting because we're going to combine the concepts of entrainment pacing with bipolar recording inside the circuit and outside the circuit. I'm going to depict as before pacing as this yellow sun icon and recording as two gray squares with the green field of view of that bipole. And before we proceed with pacing, let me first show you what a pacing artifact is. When you pace from the same channel that you're recording from, the energy associated with pacing delivery is going to create what, we, what is known as a pacing artifact, this large electrogram that is generated by the actual pacing itself rather than recording the tissue signals. And if we pace and entrain at that 280 millisecond rate that we discussed before, then during pacing, you're going to see pacing artifacts occurring at exactly that same pacing rate, 280 milliseconds. Now here is where the very interesting part of this slide comes. What happens when we stop pacing and assuming we haven't terminated the tachycardia, which continues, but we continue to record that ongoing tachycardia, what is going to be the timing between the last stimulation artifact and the first electrogram that is recorded as tachycardia continues? Now would be a good time to hit pause on the video and reflect on this and figure out which of these answers makes the most sense. And now that you've had a chance to reflect on that, the way that I tend to think about the post-pacing interval, which is what this is called, is imagining that I'm an electron. It's obviously more complicated than this, but if I am an electron that is released in that last pacing signal, where do I go? I'm gonna go around the circuit, and let me show this as an icon. I travel around the circuit, and then back to my bipole where I'm going to record a signal again. And remember, we're not pacing anymore. So the amount of time that elapsed between starting and ending that circuit is going to be the tachycardia cycle length of that circuit, which was 300 milliseconds, as you recall from before. So in this case, the post pacing interval, the time it took between that last stimulus 
of pacing and the first recorded electrogram is going to be 300 milliseconds. And just as we discussed before, now that the tachycardia is ongoing, every other spacing between electrograms as the tachycardia continues without pacing is also going to be 300 milliseconds, the tachycardia cycle length itself. Well, you might say that that last slide was anticlimactic uh, and in fact, not that interesting, but this slide is really the crux of where it all comes together and demonstrates the value of the post pacing interval. Now we're going to do the same thing in trainment and recording from the same bipole, but now we're going to do it from a remote site. We're going to pace and record from this location. And I'm gonna tell you up front that it takes 40 milliseconds for a wavefront to travel from that pacing site to the closest location of the circuit, which we're now about to entrain. So let's pace at that 280 millisecond cycle length. And we're going to see as before, pacing artifact in that same recording bipole at the 280 millisecond separation between pacing artifacts or pacer spikes. And here is the interesting part of this slide. When we stop pacing, what is going to be the separation between the last pacing artifact and the first recorded electrogram, assuming that we did not terminate the tachycardia? So here is an opportunity again to hit pause, reflect on choices A through D, and decide what you think now is going to be the timing between the two, the post pacing interval. And now that you've had a chance to reflect on that, let's do that same mental exercise and pretend that we are an electron that is released in that last paced beat, travels to the circuit, around it and back. And here we go, to the circuit, around and back to our recording bipole. And if we add up those times of the three components, going to the circuit, around the circuit, and back, we have 40 plus 300 plus another 40 on the way back. That last 40 people often forget. They think about the time it takes to get to the circuit, but forget that you have to add that same amount of time as you return from the circuit to your recording site. So the answer to this question is 380 milliseconds so longer than the tachycardia. And as tachycardia continues, you're now going to continue sending wavefronts from the circuit to your remote recording bipole at that same tachycardia rate, just like we reviewed before when talking about recording from a remote site. So look at what we've just discovered. We found that the interval that immediately follows the last paced beat can tell you whether you were pacing and recording from inside the circuit itself. And if you were, that post pacing interval will be exactly the same as the tachycardia cycle length because you don't have any to and from distance to travel. Whereas if you are away from the circuit, then you do have extra time from that last pace beat to travel to the circuit around it and to get back to your recording site. And that post pacing interval being longer than the tachycardia cycle length directly implies that you are not in the circuit and you are remote from it. This holds true even if the entrance and the exit to the circuit are not in exactly the same location. And this can happen more commonly in ventricular tachycardias, circuits in ventricular muscle, where sometimes you can have an entrance in one location and an exit in another location. But regardless, if you are not in the circuit itself and you are remote from it, there's going to be added time to get to the entrance and from the exit so that your post pacing interval is going to be longer than the tachycardia cycle length. So let's apply the concepts that we just reviewed and learned to an actual clinical case. Here's a patient who's 74 years old. He had coronary disease and a prior inferior myocardial infarction. 
along with bypass surgery, and he presents to us in atrial flutter. We can see here, depicted by the red arrows, flutter waves with variable AV conduction and a slightly irregular ventricular response rate. And if we look at the morphology of those flutter waves, we can see that in lead two, they have somewhat of a characteristic sawtoothed pattern that is commonly seen in typical counterclockwise right atrial flutter. And in V1, those flutter waves appear to be positive. So you might, by this morphology, conclude that this is counterclockwise right atrial flutter, or known as typical flutter. But if you look at lead three, eh, the flutter waves are somewhat flat and actually not the negative sawtooth pattern that you typically see in that inferior lead. So there's a little bit of question whether this morphology is consistent with typical flutter or not. So that's where intracardiac recordings and entrainment pacing can be extremely helpful. Here is an LAO view of the heart with a 20 pole catheter in place. And we've reviewed in my electrogram recording modules how these electrodes are numbered. In this case, I'm actually going to number for ease of discussion pairs of electrodes rather than the electrodes themselves. You'll remember that the distal end is always number one, and if you're numbering the electrodes, then you'd count one, two, three, four, five, six, but I'm simply going to refer to the 20 electrodes as 10 pairs. In this LAO view, this 20 pole catheter is shown to be wrapped around the right atrium, hugging the lateral wall of the right atrium, with the tip of the catheter extending partway into the coronary sinus at the floor of the left atrium. This will be important anatomically when we look at pacing sites and electrogram recordings. So here are the bipolar electrograms from these 10 bipoles on this duodeca catheter wrapping around the right atrium and into the coronary sinus. And the first thing you should always do when looking at intracardiac recordings, as we discussed in my introduction to electrogram module series, is look at the left side of the screen so that you know exactly what you're looking at and the sequence that is displayed on the screen. Because different people may display these electrograms in different orders and you don't wanna get confused. So here I've shown the duodeca 10 pair at the top all the way down to the duodeca one pair at the bottom. And remember one and two are in the coronary sinus. If we look at the timing between electrograms in all of these pairs, we're going to see that the cycle length of this tachycardia is 260 milliseconds. And if we look at the activation sequence, we're going to see that duodeca 10 is first, followed by nine and eight and seven and six. And let's review on the fluoroscopy image what that means in terms of the anatomy. And here again is that duodeca catheter in the LAO view showing how it is resting along the roof and lateral wall of the right atrium and traveling into the left atrium. And if we think of the activation sequence of the 10 bipoles that we just reviewed, we can see that the sequence of activation suggests a wavefront that's traveling in a counterclockwise direction down the lateral wall of the right atrium, across the floor and the isthmus of the right atrium, and on into the beginning of the coronary sinus and floor of the left atrium. One might initially conclude that this is counterclockwise typical flutter, but actually there is more than one mechanism that could be reflected in this activation sequence. The first is typical right atrial flutter, which is a circuit around the right atrium traveling up the septum, over the roof, back down and through the isthmus. However, if you had a smaller circuit that was located 
on the roof of the right atrium or perhaps near the superior vena cava, maybe at a cannulation site from this patient's previous surgery, you could have an activation sequence that looks very similar to typical flutter, even though the circuit isn't actually traveling all the way around that right atrial chamber. And similarly, you can even have a left atrial circuit, probably a small one, near the roof, near the septal side of the left atrium that breaks over Bachmann's bundle to get to the right atrium, perhaps faster than it's traveling down to the floor of the left atrium, and again, activating the right atrium and floor of the right atrium and even into the coronary sinus in this counterclockwise fashion, even though the circuit could be located on the opposite side of the septum. So activation sequence alone in these 10 bipoles does not necessarily tell us the location and size of the circuit. And that is where entrainment pacing plays a wonderful role. So here is our first entrainment pacing maneuver performed from bipole D9. And I know that I'm pacing from that site because I can see this pacing artifact largest in that particular bipole. So let's quickly review anatomically where D9 is located. You can see it up there near the top lateral portion of the right atrium. And let's see what happens as we do this pacing maneuver, this entrainment maneuver, and come off pacing. So first of all, we can see we're pacing at 240 milliseconds, and so the pacing artifacts are separated by exactly that amount, that interval. We can see that we did not stop the tachycardia, which continues at 260 milliseconds, just like we saw on the initial slide of intracardiac recordings. And there are a couple things left to look at before we can interpret this entrainment maneuver. The first and most critical is to make sure that in fact, during pacing, we captured the chamber and accelerated the chamber to our pacing rate. So you can see here on the bottom of the screen, we're looking at electrograms, not the pacing artifact, but electrograms from a different pair of electrodes. And it shows that we have accelerated the chamber rate to the pacing cycle length, 240 milliseconds, including on that last paced beat. So that tells us that we captured, that we captured on that last beat, and therefore this pacing maneuver is a valid one to interpret. And the next thing that we do, other than ensuring that the tachycardia indeed continues at the same cycle length that it was going before we came on pacing, the next thing to do is to measure that post pacing interval in the channel from which we were pacing, which is D9 in this case. And here, this interval is 260 milliseconds, which is exactly the same as the tachycardia cycle length. That tells us that D9 is in the circuit because the post pacing interval is exactly the same as the tachycardia cycle length. Great, that's one data point that's extremely useful. So here we are pacing from a different site here, D5. And again, I know that because I see the large pacing artifact in that channel. We're pacing again at 240 milliseconds from this location that's now in the low lateral right atrium as shown in the upper right of this slide. And we can see that the pacing artifact is at this 240 millisecond rate. And we can also see that the tachycardia continued after we came off pacing and it continued at exactly the same cycle length, 260 milliseconds that it was going before we came on pacing. And then before we interpret the post pacing interval, we need to make sure that we accelerated the chamber to the pacing rate that we captured on all beats, including the last one. And sure enough, the electrograms here in a different bipole, D1 again in this case, have been accelerated to the pacing rate of 240 milliseconds. So we did in fact 
and train the tachycardia and accelerate the chamber to the pacing rate. So now we can look at the post pacing interval in that pair of electrodes, that bipole that we paced from, came off pacing and look at the first return electrogram following cessation of pacing. And again at D5, the post pacing interval is the same as the tachycardia cycle length, suggesting that D5 is also in the circuit. Another very helpful piece of information. Let's pace from yet one more site in the duodeca catheter, this time from D1. D1, as you recall, is located now in the floor of the left atrium, partway into the coronary sinus. We can see we're pacing from D1 because the pacing artifact is largest in that bipole. So let's go through exactly the same exercise again. Here are the pacing stimuli at 240 milliseconds as we had desired. We can see that we did not terminate the tachycardia and it continues at 260 milliseconds after we stopped pacing. We can see that we accelerated the chamber. We successfully entrained the tachycardia and accelerated the atria to the 240 millisecond cycle length that we were pacing at. And that means that we can now evaluate the post pacing interval in that pacing pair of electrodes from the last paced beat to the first recorded electrogram when we come off pacing. And this time we see that the post pacing interval is significantly longer than the tachycardia cycle length, which suggests that that location over here in the left atrium is not in the circuit because we had to travel to and from the circuit in addition to traveling around it to get from that last pacing stimulus to the first return electrogram in that same bipole. And let's do one more entrainment pacing maneuver, this time from an ablation catheter that was introduced to the right atrium and is sitting at the moment on the floor of the right atrium in the cavotricuspid isthmus. I guess we'll refer to it right now as a mapping catheter because we're not delivering energy at this point, but we're moving it around the right atrium, meaning we're mapping. Um, and here we are pacing with large pacing artifacts seen in the ablation catheter. And then this is the last pace speed and we come off. And let's go through the, exactly the same exercise that we went through in the three previous slides. Here we see that we're pacing at 240 milliseconds like before. And we are have not terminated the tachycardia, but it continues uninterrupted at that same 260 millisecond cycle length. And following that last pacing beat, we have accelerated electrograms at a different bipole to the pacing rate. So again, we have successfully entrained and accelerated the atria to the pacing rate, which means we can interpret this post pacing interval, which we now measure and show that it is also at 260 milliseconds, the same as the tachycardia. So this site on the isthmus in the right atrium between the inferior vena cava and the tricuspid annulus is also in the circuit. So what have we learned after doing these entrainment pacing maneuvers and evaluating the post pacing intervals at various sites? I'm summarizing on this image in the upper right the fact that from duodeca nine, we showed that we were in the circuit because the post pacing interval matched the tachycardia cycle length. And the same holds true for duodeca five and from the ablation catheter on the cavotricuspid isthmus, all of those three sites were in the circuit. But duodeca one in the coronary sinus on the floor of the left atrium was not in the circuit and was remote from it. So when we were thinking about the possible circuits that could result in the initial pattern that we saw, we talked about right atrial flutter, we talked about a circuit on the roof, and we talked about something over here in the left atrium. 
but given that we now know that these sites are all in the circuit, the only possible circuit that's consistent with that electrogram sequence and these post-pacing interval and entrainment maneuvers showing that these sites are in the circuit is in fact counterclockwise right atrial flutter, also known as typical flutter. And we can therefore proceed with ablation across the cavotricuspid isthmus, which is the shortest distance to terminate this circuit and permanently cure it and prevent it from recurring. Sure enough, as we ablated on the cavotricuspid isthmus, right between duodeca four and five coming across here, the tachycardia terminated. It came around 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5 is the last electrogram that you see. And there's no electrogram in 4 because the circuit was interrupted right there on the isthmus. So entrainment demonstrated exactly what we hoped, that this was a simple ablation in the right atrium and a curative procedure for this patient. So in summary, when you pace faster than a reentrant tachycardia, you can take over the circuit, and this is known as entrainment pacing or continuous resetting of the circuit. The post pacing interval is a valid measurement only when you accelerate the chamber to the pacing rate successfully, and the tachycardia does not terminate or change when pacing is stopped. If the post pacing interval is the same as the tachycardia cycle length, that means that the site from which you were pacing was in the circuit. If the post pacing interval is greater than the tachycardia cycle length, that means that that pacing site was remote from the circuit and you had extra time that it takes for the signal to travel from the pacing site to the circuit and then a return path from the circuit to your recording site, which is the same as the pacing site. There are more sophisticated uses and interpretation of entrainment pacing, specifically in scar-related ventricular tachycardia, which I will review in a separate presentation. But I hope you enjoyed the basics in this presentation to get you started in the concepts of reentry and entrainment pacing.